Thank you so much, uh, Hannah, for that. Well, it's certainly strong meat uh, subject for this evening, but it's also a, a topic which is all around us, where the debates and arguments and facts and counterfacts are raging. So I'm particularly pleased to, uh, to be in the chair tonight and have two people who don't agree at all, at least as far uh, as I know, I'm about to find out, but who have equally trenchant and fluent ways of approaching this debate, whether it's in their writing or tonight. So you, you've heard uh, who they are from Hannah, but I would just like to tell you how it's going to, to work in practice for a bit. I get to basically direct the trains, which is my favorite bit of the job. Uh, 10 minutes each for each of our speakers. We're going to go to Kindy first for 10 minutes on is the West fundamentally racist? At nine minutes, I will use my prerogative, reach out to my clunkily and ill-balanced glass of water in the hope that it sort of makes it to the, at the end of the table. And uh, hopefully that would just sort of prompt you to, to wind up, Kindy. And then we'll flip over to Jeremy and do exactly the same because Intelligence Squared is a place of equal and balanced debate and pure reason, as we all know. Uh, what would be great is if you uh, send in your questions along the way. I think most of you probably know the, the rubric on that if you go through the, the Q&A. And if you don't want your name to be mentioned, there is a button called anonymous and then press send and um, we'll have a little debate obviously between our two panelists before we go to questions but it's very helpful if we can see you sending some in. So with that and as I think the title of this debate takes us uh, right into the content that uh, we'd like to discuss I'm going to hand over to Kinder West to tell us why the West is fundamentally racist. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for people for coming as well. Um, so in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It is unfortunately something which I grew up with in my school, uh, nursery rhyme learning, and, and many of you will have as well. And Columbus is a really important figure, the figure actually on the front of the new age of empire for a reason, uh, because Columbus is perhaps, not perhaps, is the most revered figure in the United States. You have uh, Columbia, District of Columbia, where the seat of government is, you have Columbus, you have Columbus High School. Columbus is all over the United States of America, which should be somewhat surprising given that he never actually set foot in the United States of America, which does tell us just how important Columbus was and 1492 was, because that um, wrong turn, accidental uh, so called discovery of, uh, and where actually Columbus actually landed on what we now would call Haiti and Dominican Republic, which is then was called Hispaniola is the founding point, the turning point of the West. It's so important uh, for Western development, which is why Columbus is so revered and has a country even in South America that death is uh, Colombia. Now, why was it so important? That westward expansion was, was vital because at this point in 1492, uh, the West was not advanced. The West was not what we think of it today in any way, shape or form. The West did not, did not really exist. And it is this move into the, into, the, into, into the Americas which sets up this Atlantic system. So at first it is the gold and the silver um, in South America predominantly that was used to, to fill the reserves and to produce the capital for European countries. This was firstly Portugal and Spain, but that, that wealth flowed throughout Europe. Um, Amsterdam became a center for commerce and industry, et cetera. Uh, this gold and silver was also important to make inroads into the East. It might surprise you to learn that the Taj Mahal is actually um, paved with gold from um, mines in Brazil, right? So this Atlantic system is absolutely essential to giving the basis for the emergence of what we would think of as the West. Um, not, not too long after this, we start to have the commodities, which bring in industrialization, sugar and cotton in particular, which are absolutely indispensable to the growth of Western economy. If you think about industrial, if you think about, because sometimes when we think about the Atlantic system, we just think about the port cities, places like Bristol, uh, Liverpool, which literally became, literally became to being of the Atlantic system. But we also have to think about my hometown, Birmingham, which made iron, which made change, which made guns. We have to think about a place like Manchester and that, um, that dreamy vision we have of the cotton mills. Uh, that cotton was so important. I mean, cotton in particular, sugar and cotton was so important with the first two things that went through the um, steam engine. And we think about Britain and we think about steam power. And again, I grew up in Birmingham, so I know a lot about um, James Watt. Uh, Chamberlain, Bolton, these great industrialists, but the Atlantic system is really where they got their goods from, which this is what allowed these cities to develop. 
um, this Atlantic system also created the conditions for the working class. We think about the industrial working class in the factories of, of Lancashire. This was powered by the Atlantic system. The Atlantic system is, is the West. This is why I say the West. This is why we should focus on the West. That trade uh, between the, the American colonies, uh, Latin America, Europe, and Africa, that was absolutely indispensable. Everything we think about, industrial revolution, the scientific revolution, the political revolution, would not have been possible without the Atlantic system. Now, that's important because what was the basis of the Atlantic system? It wasn't just commerce and industry. It was a particular kind of commerce and industry. At the time when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, Europe was behind, one of the few places in the world that was emerging from a dark age. And in order to, to create this Atlantic system, which produced the wealth and the basis of the economy that we have today, uh, the, the West, the European nations, had to literally hack, burn, and roast their way into progress. Columbus set off the largest genocide in human history. So in the Americas, we, we rarely talk about this, but up to, and I was, I was actually surprised at the numbers when I, when I was writing the book, the midpoint estimate of the amounts of deaths in the Americas after European contact is 68 million, I believe. And if you just look at his, what was then Hispaniola, the midpoint estimate, and so it could be high, it could be low, but the midpoint estimate of inhabitants of the island when Columbus landed was 8 million. By the time Columbus left in 1512, the mid, their midpoint estimate again is 100,000. And by um, 1542, there were only 200 natives left. In fact, up to 98, 99% of some of the native population are literally erased from the earth. But that was necessary. That was the clearing the way for this Atlantic system to come into being, right? That we, we can kind of imagine that could it have happened another way? It happened this way. And this way meant that the Americas became the Garden of Eden for Europe. It became the place where Europeans of all hues, um, classes could go to make their wealth, et cetera. And, and that genocide is absolutely essential to allowing that to happen. The other really key building point of the Atlantic system, of course, is the slave trade. Slavery, again, utterly indispensable. Once the natives had been exhausted for their labor, Europeans needed to turn somewhere else. And where did they turn? They turned to Africa. And for two to 300 years, depending, uh, took millions of young working age Africans, stole them from the continent. The, the, the lowest estimate is that 12 million people were uh, forcibly transported from Africa to the Americas. Uh, the lowest estimate, again, is that double that number died either on the continent or in transit. So the minimum we're talking about is 36 million people taken out of Africa to fulfill this trade. And again, remember, what was the key commodities that built the West? Sugar and cotton, tobacco, all these things which were absolutely essential, right? So here you can see in the Americas the building blocks of imperialism and also that wealth. Remember at the time before Columbus, they were, the West was behind. It was the wealth from the Atlantic system that enabled uh, the West to take over the rest of the world, to take over the East, et cetera. And from here, you can see a very clear logic of white supremacy, that black and brown life is disposable in the pursuit of Western progress. It began in 1492, it becomes cemented in the, set, in the centuries that follow, and, then you, and, and it becomes even more cemented in the, in the scholarship, in the work, in the enlightenment, in Western European thought. It is not coincidental that it took a couple of hundred years after Columbus. I mean, the, the age of re so-called reason is after the West has laid waste to large parts of the world, after we've that the West has enslaved millions of people, after the West has taken over the world. And then you have these figures like Immanuel Kant, like Locke, like Rousseau, theorizing from a place of white supremacy saying, look, this is how the world is. The white, white people must be superior because look, we're superior. And this becomes the basis of our thought even today, unfortunately, this hierarchy where you have white on the top, black on the bottom and everywhere else in between. Moving to the present day, if you look at global inequality, it shouldn't surprise us to find that we've actually created the world in the image of white supremacy. The poorest part of the world is so-called sub-Saharan Africa. The richest parts of the world um, are, are the West where white people live, right? There's a hierarchy in between of white supremacy. We have literally created the world in the image of white supremacy. And what happened and what changed is the old system, and this is why I call it the new age, the old system of imperialism, European dominated, empires, large scale violence, that couldn't hold forever. For one, there was resistance, there was revolts, there were rebellions. It was not possible to keep subjugating people in that manner. Uh, the second part, the empires collide, the empires collapse. What are the second, uh, the first world war in particular, the second world war, but empires collapse, uh, um, 
empires coming to a head, right? And the third thing that we see very clearly with the Nazis is the boomerang effect. Uh, what um, Amos Azair calls the boomerang effect where racism, fascism, the logic of white supremacy comes into Europe and becomes enacted on white bodies and everybody turns around and goes, well, this was a really bad idea. So after the second world war, this, that old system can't maintain. And what happens is there is a shift. There is a shift where it's no longer European empires that dominate, it is America that dominates. It's not a coincidence that the United States becomes a new seat. That was kind of always logical, given that the United States is just a more extreme version of Europe, a place where Europeans could act in ultimate barbarism to um, maximize their resources. Uh, we have a shift away from, not completely, but mostly away from the kind of violence that was associated with slavery in the, in, in the imperial imperial era at this point it's not necessary because you've already underdeveloped the world you've already created the conditions where the west is on top and so now we have financial There's no racism. great time to do this oh, <laughs> okay, oh, sorry. i'm just going to, to do idea. it now okay I think uh, it, I'm so gonna go. advanced technology uh, has <laughs> infiltrated this debate you have a minute to a minute summarize left. okay sorry okay one minute i'm gonna go um where was i so this was the end anyway so yeah you have economic um world bank imf you, uh, the UN even, in global imbalances tra in trade, in trade, etc. And so a uh, one stat I will end with here, which I think makes the point, 9 million people die every year through hunger. A child dies every 10 seconds because they don't have access to food. All of those children, almost all of them exclusively, are black and brown. The logic of empire is still very much with us. It is delivered in a different way, but the mechanism is still there. And it goes back to the very founding of what the West is. The West is white supremacy, and it cannot be anything else. Thank you very much for, for coming there. I think that is absolutely on point and on, on, the, on the clock. Um, well, that makes really a, a very strong case there for Kahinda's argument uh, as laid out in the new age of empire, but delving back into the roots and, and where he sees that taking the world that we live in today and the arguments all around us. Jeremy Black, also historian, uh, author of many books, including A Brief History of Slavery and the British Empire History in a Debate, uh, Inter Alia. Um, Jeremy, you have your 10 minutes beginning now on why the West is not fundamentally racist. Well, could I uh, take up some of Kalinda's points? Uh, and I want to look at some of them empirically, just items of fact, and some of them conceptually. And then, well, I'm always interested when historians disagree, um, I want to try and give some historiographical basis. So, uh, you know, it won't surprise people that I'm, I'm not uh, of the same mind. Um, for example, I don't see the demographics as being the, the same as Kalindi does, uh, I would argue that most of the deaths in the Caribbean that occurred were a result of influenza and smallpox and not, as he calls it, genocide, that the very last thing that the Spaniards wanted to do was to have to buy a labour force in Africa and transport it across the Atlantic. And if you look at uh, colonies like Peru or Mexico, there are relatively few uh, African slaves because the majority of the population doesn't die in some kind of genocide and remains as you know, if Kalindi visits Latin America today, he will find that in much of Latin America, you can see very readily, and DNA work will also substantiate it, there are the descendants of those people who were there prior to the Spaniards. So I don't recognise the demography, and whilst I agree with him that roughly 11 to 12 million people were transported across the Atlantic, I think his figure that twice that number died in transit is just fanciful. It's not what the specialist literature on the subject uh, argues. And again, I, I would be disinclined to agree with him about the salience of uh, sugar and cotton. To me, the key commodities are coal and iron. And I read his book with some interest. I thought it, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's arguing a case very clearly and he's cogent and fluent, but I think he's inclined to leave out what doesn't fit in. I mean, quite clearly there has been a lot of whatever we might refer to as racism in the history of the West. That is not the same thing as saying that the West is fundamentally about racism. And I think there is a slippage there in the analysis 
which is problematic. Let's just put it like that. And again, for example, if you come to the Enlightenment, now as Kalindi will know, there is an enormous literature on the Enlightenment. It's being discussed in very many different ways. And as he eloquently argues, there is a new left critique of it, rather old left actually by now, but which presents it in the terms he does. Actually, ironically, if you think about this in 18th century terms, the whole point about the Enlightenment was that it was a movement of cultural relativism. The belief was among Enlightenment figures that um, far from Western society, necessarily being the supreme example or acme of quality. There was this fascination with the Orient in particular, um, and there was also a, an interest, strong interest, in, as it were, new frontiers, particularly in the South Seas. So again, I would argue and, you know, I don't think this would be much of a surprise to specialists on the Enlightenment, um, that in fact the Enlightenment is about cultural relativism far more than Kalindi portrays it as a matter of white supremacists. And, you know, if you look, for example, at uh, Gibbon's uh, discussion of, of um, history, and as you may know, Gibbon's actually, his book is books go up to the mid 16th century, or if you look at William Robertson, or if you look at Adam Smith, I think all of their accounts of history rather exemplify this, as indeed does Voltaire. Um, if you're looking at distinctive features of the West as an imperial system, I wouldn't say it's specifically or specifically uh, or principally racist. I mean, I think that you would get whatever you might mean by racism or tribalism or whatever you mean by it. I think it's fairly uh, continual and constant in, in world history. I think the major difference I would focus on uh, for the West in, shall we say, the 16th, 17th or 18th centuries, as opposed to the other uh, major area of the world, which had, um, as it were, the economic and demographic weight um, to move uh, to move towards great imperial strength, which is the various societies of East and South Asia. The principal difference is the West is very multipolar, doesn't in fact end up with one land power that is dominant. Um, where, so that you, know, you mention, you argue that gold and silver comes in from the new world and sort of powers everything. Actually, gold and silver helped to power Spanish power, uh, Spanish strength, and obviously Spain failed uh, to become the great power of the late 16th and early 17th century. It was defeated. Now the contrast is more readily with China, which by 1800 has got about 300 million people. Europe about then is 60 million. And China, of course, is one state. Um, and that is a very different nature. And I would argue that if you're looking at Western imperialism, uh, the, co the, the constant is this multipolarity. And it also means that Western powers have spent more of their time fighting each other than they've fought non-Westerners. And again, that doesn't really emerge adequately in Kalindi's book. So that if you wish to argue, as you know, well, some people do, that Britain is a racist society, I personally think that's misleading. But if you wish to argue that, you have to really explain why the British devoted most of the last half millennium to fighting the Spaniards, the French, the Germans, and not pro rata elsewhere. Um, so as I said, I think there is a level of complexity and I'm rather, a, you know, I'd like to think a four dimensional historian with time as the fourth dimension. And I would argue that you need to have far more complexity than was offered by the very eloquence of our opening speaker. But the last point um, on the present day, we will obviously have very differing accounts of what is going on at the present moment. But I noticed, and I the, the comments about what is really horrible levels of poverty in parts of the third world, it is also worth bearing in mind that some former um, colonized areas or areas of imperial power, so let's say for Britain, um, you know, parts of South and East Asia have done extremely well. Some former colonies, the Japanese colony of South Korea, for example, extremely successful. I don't think imperial rule itself explains why states cannot take off 
And my last point, and this is looking at the world, I'm, I'm sure many of us are shocked at what's going on in Myanmar, Burma at the present moment. I, I personally am also being very shocked at the counts coming out of Ethiopia of the fighting there. I think we have to accept that just as there have been horrible things done by Western powers, so there have been horrible things done by non-Western powers. Virtue is not a monopoly of any one state. And I also feel that as it were, banging on, I so happen to think Kalindi got it wrong, but you know, he'll have his point of view, banging on about the 16th century does not help us very much in discussing the iniquities, the inequalities and the cruelty of the modern age. It doesn't help us even more if our accounts of the past are actively misleading and if this actively misleading quality is then propagated in the modern world. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jeremy, and uh, well, there's pistols at dawn on this one, isn't it? So you have no excuse not to post lots of lots of um, lots of excellent questions for our, our two uh, panelists. A good thing about Q and A, by the way, is it can also upgrade the chair, which is and absolutely rightly. I said uh, I should have said Kindi, shouldn't I? That I got my pronunciation wrong, and I do apologise for that. I should have noticed that. Um, so, me and Lisa, I shall endeavor to, to get it right going forward. Um, so, I should come back to you really, having uh, laid out your case and heard Jeremy Black's response. Uh, teasing it out in my own mind, there seem to be two very broad areas. One is that one thing doesn't follow as much from another, Jeremy was claiming, as you laid out, Kindy. Do you think, has he, has he got a point that some links in any argument that's going to span so many centuries are going to be stronger than others and therefore do you interrogate some areas and think I'm not so sure of this as I am of my perhaps my starting point when you started us off there with a, a very graphic picture of the, the world of Columbus and what followed. Um, yeah no but I actually 100% agree with the last statement which is we need a better version of history not a misleading one. And in the, in the response, it says just some misleading things. So for instance, the idea that it's not genocide because the large amounts of the deaf did were because of disease. They knew what was happening. There was no attempt to, there's a whole literature on this of why genocide by disease is still genocide because settler colonialism erases the, the, the way of life of the natives. And it was the presence there that did that. And they didn't withdraw and say, well, let's stop and try it. They, and there were actually many times where they actively did try to kill. The idea, again, that because there's people left in Peru, that means the genocide didn't happen. I mean, that's frankly a ridiculous suggestion. If you look at places like the Caribbean, if you look at, look at places in America, the demographic issue is very, very clear. Also, if you look at the deaths through slavery, it's not just in the deaths on the ships. It is in the deaths in the interior, where the estimates are up to 40 percent of those of people died. So actually, not, again, the historiography here is, is actually inadequate, generally. And this, and this is what we think about with... Um, no, it, when, what was actually very clear and right in this book was just how how in, intertwined all of these things were. So the idea that yeah the European empires are fighting each other that is true, but they are also collaborating, and that collaboration is absolutely essential. Britain doesn't come to its naval uh, supremacy without the Dutch, right? The Spanish are, ne are needed against the French at one point, and there's and, and the Berlin Conference is probably the best example of this, where the, the European powers sit down and literally carve up the continent. So yes, they fight, and this is actually why you have this new age of empire, when it becomes clear that, that those empires fighting each other isn't the best way to go forward. And you have this new version, which is this kind of global globalization, multinational corporations, etc. But the very clear thing here is that since 1492 to today, and, and as much today, and this isn't about the past, like I gave you a lot of historical stuff, but today, black and brown life is not as valuable, and it can be used and disposed uh, for the benefit of the West. And that is still the case today, if you look at Africa, if you look at you can talk about places like China grow, doing really well. There's 400 million desperately poor people in China powering that economy. Um, and that's just a simple, unavoidable fact if you look at the empirical data. Uh, Jeremy, do you want to come back? I mean, as you say, we started to segue to, to the modern world, and I think that's right, and I think we should, because we've got uh, five minutes or so, and then we'll go to questions. But w this, this idea that you came up with lots of sort of points of objection and perhaps you would also you would argue about the historiography you would argue about the figures to what extent Jeremy do you worry that that approach to history can it can lead you to sort of what about you know, you've sort of found lots of things wrong but there could be a narrative drive which is more right than wrong and it would be too easy to dismiss that if you simply stop and and raise a point that seems perhaps to contradict an aspect but might not 
contradict the full argument that you heard from Pindi? Well, I think contextualization, in my view, is crucial. If you want to call it what aboutery, I would call it contextualization. So if slavery is so important as a trigger of large scale industrial or other development or economic development, why didn't that occur in sub-Saharan Africa, which had large scale slavery? It was that's where the slaves were being sold from. Why didn't it occur in the Indian Ocean world? There are many slaves, as you will know, transported, you referred to my history of slavery, many slaves are transported into, um, into India, many slaves are transported into the Ottoman Empire. And you know, I mean, this business of what aboutery is not very helpful. If you wish to consider how states operate, you need to consider how other states could operate within the context of that period. Um, and I'm not sure that um, presenting the West as uniquely um, expansionist in this period helps. I mean, if you're looking at the 1490s, 1500s, 15 teens, um, you know, it's helpful to put alongside what Kalindi is talking about, the Ottomans taking over Egypt or Syria or Palestine or whatever you want to call them as well. It's helpful to compare what empires are doing in order to understand their potential and also in particular to relativize this idea of racism. So no, I'm afraid to say, um, you know, I thought it was a highly articulate performance, sorry, presentation we heard, but I have to tell you, I found it very misleading and I will stick at that. And you could call that- Well, well you, you, you can, we're gonna go back to Kindy and we're gonna just go to the model world, perhaps for our last to and fro, and then take, take some questions. With that in mind, I've got some questions coming in in front of me. Um, I'd love to say, I, I feel very much at home in the Intelligence Squared family, but you do all leave your questions for the last five minutes. <laughs> so please, uh, Pop them all in a bit earlier if you've got one that's forming in your mind the next uh, 10 15 minutes would be the time to ask it and you can tweet of course using the hashtag uh, iq squared iq2 i would say as a sort of someone who always gets confused by that squared thing um uh, hashtag iq2 so can you uh, so much we could could take a, a part in the contemporary application of what, what you've talked about. One thing that interested me, and I say this as a broadcaster who probably like a lot of people has had to sort of check themselves and learn a bit and think a bit about ways that I describe things, and probably I still won't make everybody happy. So um, you, you used at one point a phrase about sort of black and brown people today, and then you took an argument from China, which was also about poverty in China. But to that extent, is, is anyone who's not white sort of covered by a, a lot of what you say? Or is this specifically about certain races and ethnicities? Because wouldn't the answers be very different if we start to, if once we start to sort that out a bit more? Um, no, so the key thing here is about the way the economy develops. So look, there is slavery in other parts of the world, there is people who don't like each other in other parts of the world. But the distinctive thing about the West is we look at why slavery in the West is so important is because it's commodity producing, because it produces wealth, unlike the Arab slave trade, which doesn't produce wealth. It's, it's, it's mostly a different kind of, has different means for it, right? And so this isn't, and within that system, there have always been black and brown people who some have done better than others. And some have done, there's always been a hierarchy. And if you look at China's rise, is the perfect example of this, where if you look at what's the logic of which China has risen on, it is the fact that they have 400 million poor people who will do the labor. Why has things got offshore to China? Because we can pay them pittance, because you wouldn't pay that, we couldn't do that here, because their lives are so devalued. And then the other part of that is where does China get the resources from to build all this stuff, to be the workshop of the world? Since China's joined the World Trade Organization, their, in, their interest in Africa has like literally gone up 20, 25 times because they're following the same model, which is you can exploit and take all the resources out of Africa and impoverish Africa. So yes, there are some rich people in China doing well, but it's based on the fact that there's a lot of poor people in China, poor because they're brown, and the fact that there's a lot of poor people in Africa, poor because they're black. So they're still off the same system. The system hasn't changed. And I think that's a really important thing. It's, it's, this is about how do we make money from the economy? And there are many black and brown people who benefit, myself included actually ironically, from this system of racial exploitation. Uh, so Jeremy, how much do you think has changed if you feel that, that the argument is not satisfactorily made to, you, to your mind by Hindi about what follows from, from what and the kind of totality of a racist West today that, that he sees. So, I mean, to what extent do you think there is racism in the Western 
system as opposed to just individuals who might object for bad reasons to someone's skin colour or background? Well, I'm sure there's both. Um, I also, I'm not quite sure how we define racism. I mean, it seems to me that racism refers both to um, pejorative behaviour, bad behaviour, which I think we would all agree is, is wrong. Um, I also think racism is a term that one could use of people trying to decide how best, uh, for good or ill reasons, to, as it were, lump people into groups for either rhetorical or analytical purposes. And one of the things that worries me, and I'm sure that's not um, Hindi's in, 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 um, intention, but one of the things that worries me is that part of this debate has an inherently racist component because it presupposes that race is the most important form of identifier as opposed to, for example, class or as opposed to gender or as opposed to religion. And all of which, as we know, have been and remain extraordinarily important in the way that human beings interact. And on top of that, we can add to the fact that uh, we know this not just from what the society we observe, but we know this from DNA in the past. There has also been an enormous amount of um, uh, interracial sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, population. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm happy with the actual use of race as the prime intellectual uh, understanding for the situation. Well, well, let's put that back to Kahindi, and then I think I'll dive into some questions because I think you've raised quite a lot of things there, which should just about, not quite neatly, and they shouldn't be neatly, but map onto some things that, that people want to talk more about. But Kindy, I felt I should let you come back on that point because it's a it's one that's off, often raised. Why such emphasis on race, arguably to the exclusion of other factors which might weigh just as powerfully in identity or indeed in an argument about history or politics? It's ironic when we celebrate empiric empiricism, right? Look at the evidence, and this is very clear. You look at the evidence around the wealth gap in this country, it is clearly racialized, like so obviously racialized. Look at global inequality, it is racialized. A sub Saharan, so called sub Saharan Africa, is the poorest part of the world. That is not it. That's not, I didn't make it that way. That is the case. I mean, but what we do is we somehow miss this when we talk about racism. Racism is not the prejudices of individuals. I might not like lots of people. It's not important. It's about the institutions and it's about the systems and it's about how that plays out in real world. And if you are looking at inequality today, there is no genuine, real, genuine way to look at this that takes away race because race is the key definer. And it really is globally and also on a national level as well. Right, okay, let's dive into some of these questions. Actually, I'll just stick with you, uh, Kindi, for just a moment from uh, Eric Levine. How does Kindi account for a black US president 2008 to 2016 and a black vice president today? Uh, again, simply like because you have black people who are being successful, I'm a professor, I'm successful, I'm success more successful than most people in the world, right? That doesn't mean the system isn't racist. And it shouldn't be a coincidence that Black Lives Matter starts on the Barack Obama's presidency. And in fact, if you actually look at the data, again, the stats, the empirics, every measure for um, African-American success economically went down under Barack Obama's presidency, apart from one, which is the employment rate went up a little bit, but food stamp usage went up by about 10 times because the kind of jobs African-Americans were getting were poverty wages. So for the worst, the, you got a stat about racism in America, in New York in 2015, uh, New York City, half of all African-Americans who had jobs worked in fast food restaurants. That's what racism looks like in America. And it doesn't matter if you've got a black president or black vice president, it's about looking at the, the state of black America as a whole, which is probably worse than it was 50 years ago. A um, question to you, Jeremy, from Larry. I think it's Kazin Kazingisi. Excuse me if I'm mangling that along the way. Can Jeremy address the point about the wealth of cities like Birmingham, Liverpool, Brighton, etc., being a direct result of slavery and imperialism? It was on my mind as well because I was just presenting something earlier uh, today for the, the BBC about Liverpool uh, and the biennial, which is very much around this and now very interrogated in, in the arts and in, in the cultural world. Uh, is it a point we need to dwell on more, Jeremy? What do you make of it? No, I mean, I think that there is obviously a certain amount of wealth came in through colonial trade. 
but I would say that the reason that um, the British economy took off in the late 18th and 19th century was not because it was a society that had plantation uh, goods on that basis. You would have expected Portugal to have done much better. Portugal, Portuguese empire had more slaves and you know, Brazil was the most uh, profitable slave society. Um, I actually think that Liverpool also owes a lot of its wealth to the fact that it is the entrepot through which uh, Manchester and, um, and Lancashire is exporting. So I think it's more complex. There is clearly partly yes, but partly no. And again, I, I don't want to dwell on this point. It's not pistols at dawn, certainly not on my part. What I'm trying to do is to talk about complexity and I think that that I'm, I'm sorry if that regard if some people find that hostile. I'm, I certainly I don't I don't think the other speaker finds it hostile. I no, I think I meant rhetorically. Oh, uh, rhetorically. I think. It's it was a metaphor. Oh, was a Mind metaphor. If you have to explain a metaphor, it's probably a disaster. But, you know, it really it was a rhetorical I do, point. I really do think this, that too much of the modern world and then so-called culture wars are people asserting virtue as a monopoly for their position. I think anybody who is good as an analyst can understand complexity. And, you know, um, so yes, Birmingham, for example, which you asked, certain degree of, of wealth in Birmingham clearly comes from processing goods from the other side of the Atlantic. But actually, most of Birmingham's growth in the 19th century came from the, um, the uh, manufacturing of local products there, particularly metal based uh, products. Anyway, let's, you know. Okay. Well, I had, had that that what that one over. I think um, is racism. Is uh, Lucia oh, Halpern is racism uniquely Western? Are your whites uniquely racist? I think probably you mean you described as such. Or is there racism in the African and Asian continents? If so, in which ways have racism in Africa and Asia contributed to economic development or the lack thereof? Uh, Kindia, I'll, I'll come to you first. And yeah, I, I was thinking something along those lines and also then how would you dis how would you account for the differences and at what point do, you know is there also some responsibility for governments for electorates for for people in, inside countries them, themselves who are no longer under a colonial yoke you first and then uh, um yeah so i think the, the the key difference is that then this part of the problem is conceptually we talk about prejudice and racism as the same same thing and we should really stop doing that right so there's certainly places where prejudice is a huge thing, has been, and even the ideas of Africans not being human beings, there's actually an Arab, Arab slave trade predates the European slave trade, people like Ibn Khaldun very clearly said the Negro is not human, and most European ideas, not to be too provocative, are really from somewhere else, and actually racism was one of them, right? But the difference is, and this is the argument I'm making here, is that that racism becomes inscribed into the political and economic system, and it becomes indelible, you can't, the white supremacy becomes the system. The idea of enslaving Africans, the idea of exploiting India and the African continent, the idea of genocide, that becomes the basis for which we produce wealth. And I would argue it's still the basis which, with which we produce wealth. If you look where the sweatshops are, if you look where who's, what countries are being exploited, it's still the case today. And that's how we when, we, when I say racism, that's what I'm referring to. And certainly there are Africans, Asians who are doing exactly the same thing, right? Who are, who are benefiting from that system and playing into it. And yes, they are in the same way as West, uh, uh, they're also racist. But, you know, all white people are not racist and this is not just something that white people do. It's structural. Uh, the contention was the West is racist, but a lot of what you described struck me as very familiar having covered the Soviet Union, which was also a great exploiter of countries that fell under or had no choice but to fall under its influence. So it seems to me that you're making a point that it isn't specifically about the West then, that there seems to, at which point is it then universal, this tendency to well, no, I mean, plunder? I think it's, it's the differences between plundering and the actual economy being based on white supremacy. And now the, the Europe, Russia and the East is now this part of the West. China is now this part of the West. So as country, and the, the West, given that the West is due, it's been very successful. It is kind of globalized now. But that's why you can see many countries that we wouldn't think about as being in the West are essentially in, embracing that Western model, but it still relies on white supremacy fundamentally, which is why the world hasn't changed as much as we'd like to think. Question from Robert Nadler, I think, uh, goes well to you, Jeremy. The West may have spent more time and treasure fighting 
each other, but also a lot of energy colonizing the world. The fact they may have spent less of this on fighting each other, which I think was uh, to a point that, that you made made earlier, that they were often more preoccupied with that than, than they were um, in, in oppressing those of a different color, is a function of the ease with which military power overcame militarily more primitive societies. Not to acknowledge that, uh, says Robert, is misleading. Your thoughts? Well, I, first of all, I'd ask Robert to read many books I've written on military history, and he will also know, if you're looking at Africa, most of Africa was not in any way conquered by Western powers until the late 19th century. Indeed, uh, the state that put the greatest effort into it, which was Portugal, uh, had repeated checks and defeats in Morocco, in Angola and Mozambique. So he's really producing an account of military history, which is about 50 years out of date. Um, so no, it wasn't easy to conquer the non-West, and that is a fallacy, and it means that people read from the late 19th century, when there was such a conquest, over to earlier periods. But let me just take some point which I thought was really interesting about uh, Hindi's uh, work, because I was thinking about where it was familiar to me from. And what he's done is he's added a very interesting, I, I so happen to think it's wrong, but then, you know, others will have a different viewpoint. He's added a very interesting racial inflection to the work by the world systems theorists, people like Emmanuel Wallerstein, who produced, and to a degree, the later work by Braudel when he looks at world history. And to a degree, what he's done is he's produced Class, he's taken a sort of classic literature about capitalism that was being produced in the 60s and 70s and given it a kind of racial component which also draws on a degree, a tranche of Cold War thinking. I mean, anti-Western Cold War thinking. And, you know, I think it would help. I mean, all of us, I mean, I'm sure people could do the same thing with me. I don't, you know, it helps all of us if we can locate our ideas and understand how they interact with other people's ideas. So there's a degree here which is very familiar. There's a degree which is a bit original and the originality is the strong element of, I think, racial anger in there. Um, but as I've said, I think it is too simplistic because it underplays other dynamics in economic development and in identity. Uh, turning to the UK, this one is from Anonymous, but I think it, uh, it, it's a question a lot of people would, would like to, to hear both your answers to. In the UK, to what extent is poverty determined by race, as opposed to by other factors, including education, family structure, religion, place of birth, etc.? Because the data, I don't remember from my not too distant days as a public policy editor, but there's, there are quite a lot of different data points on, on this, which people have a habit of picking through. Would that be a fair way to look at it, Hindi, or do you see a clearer picture? Um, I just want to come to this point, uh, Jeremy. Oh, I'm so sorry, do about, come back on the previous I, point. I'm I think, just keen to look, move on. Yeah, as somebody who's, who's well acquainted with world systems analysis, and this is what happens a lot of the time with this argument, is the black radical tradition, people like Nkrumah and neocolonialism, go back to the Negro question in the black Marxist uh, tradition, even the Garvey to, um, to some extent, you know, is separate from, this is not, I mean, my argument is not particularly new in that sense. It is, there's a long tradition of this, which isn't world systems analysis. And it actually corrects, there's a really excellent book by Cedric Robinson in the, in the, eight, in the 80s, where he corrects Marxism. He says, what does Marxism get wrong? Is that Marxism misses out the fact that white supremacy creates class relations. And so that's the problem with Marxism. It is missed out the point that white supremacy is the whole thing, and that creates all these clash relations we think about. So it is, it certainly isn't just an updated version of, um, of world systems analysis. On the question of the UK, I think the data is clear. The data is obvious. The data is it's, it's, it's blatantly there. It's been there. If you look at really anything about wealth, or the wealth gap will be the big one. Um, if you look at educational attainment, if you look at um, policing, if you, look, if you look at all the stats, will tell you the same thing. The governments keep report, keep having. Um, reviews and it, it, can we get some more evidence people telling you what are you thing? saying that it is saying because for our, i mean if you look at something like educational attainment you see ethnic groups with widely different outcomes you see a big big problem uh, yeah. uh, about poor white working class boys in in particular you see also great successes in in certain communities who are in it doing very well in the education system so it, it does seem to be something of a mixed picture now it isn't to say that overall you wouldn't find that in poorer groups of society of a certain ethnic 
background, you'll have education under performance. But there is, you, you did say it was clear, I think the suggestion was unambiguous, but it doesn't account so well for differences between communities of a different ethnic origin um, other than white British. No, it really does. I mean, actually, the education is the one which gets misplayed all the time. That stat about uh, poor white boys, look, poor people do badly. That's not a surprise. Who could be surprised about that? We live in a capitalist society. But that stat gets well overplayed because actually that is a stat which actually tells us about the racialization of poverty. So when you take the, the what we actually have a the stat there is um, people who are qualified for free school meals, which is not class, it's people who qualify for free school meals. Roughly 10% of white families qualify for free school meals. 40% of black African families qualify for free school meals. So you cannot compare the bottom 10% of white people and 40% of black Africans and then wonder why there's a difference. This, this actually tells us this, you're far more likely to be on free school meals if you're black or brown for lots of reasons. And a lot of that is to do with racism in the employment market. So you know we know that other kinds of capital um, are important to educational attainment. So you might have a black, a black African family who has lots of education, degrees in their household, but still qualify for free school meals because of racism, right? And if you track that through to even excesses in, if you go to university level, the there is at university, there is a white, non-white gap. So even the groups that do well, that school do badly in, in university. And then if you go to employment, you can see the gap. So actually that stat doesn't tell us anything. The only thing that the education stat tells us is that this is really about this is really about racism, uh, but it gets overplayed because it is one area where you can look at it on the surface and say, "Oh, look at the poor white people." Right? I think you're overplaying, if you don't mind, the uh, idea that there are whites versus non-whites. I think that, uh, as I understand it, and I, I I actually subscribe to the Economist, and I notice they've done some very interesting work. Um, distinguishing between uh, Blacks of African origins, Blacks of Caribbean origin, uh, Indians of Hindu origin, um, um, South Asian Muslims, uh, Chinese, and in fact, some of those groups do considerably better than whites. Um, so I think you're, if you don't mind me saying so, you're running together an enormous range, as indeed you are also doing on the world scale. You will know that, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, there are some countries which have higher levels of social capital, higher levels of living standards, more internal peace than there are other countries. And this is not because of ethnic or racial differences. Uh, this is because of very complex factors, which accounts for one, some, why some societies, some areas do better than others. And I do, I'm going to, you know, you can ignore me as much as you like, but I want listeners to take away the message that it is ridiculous to say that race is the single interpretive concept that explains differences in the world in the past or the present day. That is a nonsense. If I had been teaching, I wouldn't take that from a student. It is nonsense. All right, just to, just to come back a bit a second. Every distinction you can make with educational attainment actually and ec 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 income gaps between Indian groups here, Sikh groups, is actually about class. It's about how people came into the country. So my family came into the country from the Caribbean poor because there was that was an open route of uh, migration. Uh, West Africans, uh, not now so much, but if you look historically, came in as students, had more money. So they did better. We tend to find that with Sikh communities versus Pakistani communities. It's actually, if you put this in its global context, you can explain this very clearly by saying who is it that's coming in, what class dimensions they come with, and those class dimensions are also heavily racialized. On the global scale, it's the same way. Look, I'm not saying that race is the only thing. Of course, there's other things. I'm saying it's the fundamental thing. And then, so yeah, you can look at Africa and say there's different parts and there's different things. Of course there are, right? But generally speaking, if you look at the African continent, there is absolutely no way to have an argument, to, to understand the situation the countries are in without race. Doesn't mean it's the only thing, but it is certainly there. It's always there. And it's fundamental to understanding the continent and the world. Here's a great follow-up question from Tam McDonald. To the extent we can get away from binary declarations about the West being or not being partly or totally racist, what would the speakers suggest are the answers to the challenge of making things better for the future so that we don't have the same discussion going on this way in a hundred years time? Well, this one's coming off at seven, so you've got nothing to worry about, guys. But um, <laughs> but it's, a, it's a, the sense of the question is a good one. Uh, kid, you're laughing there. Um, but I'm, going, I'm going to go to Jeremy first on this. They're back to you. Um, yes, what would you, assuming, as you say, you know, you, you both now feel quite dug into to your positions and what you want to, to defend. Um, what might you want to change? So, as Tam says, we're not back doing this when I will be 121. <laughs> well, I think there are multiple 
factors, paths to the future. And um, I would actually like to say that I think it's unpredictable the challenges we are going to face or the species is going to face, whichever color, ethnicity, gender, whatever one's talking about. And I do actually believe, I know this sounds very wet, but I do believe that being tolerant of other people's views is absolutely crucial. So a hard liberalism, if you like, uh, a hard defense of enlightenment values. Um, and I think that those who spend, and I'm not saying the other speaker is doing so, but I think some people do do so in these, in these so-called culture wars, those who claim a monopoly of virtue are not helpful. And whether or not you might agree with them on specific points, whether or not you might sympathize with them on specific points, you cannot as a society on the global scale or the on the national scale or as friends work on any other basis if you believe than, than believing that people who have differing views to you might well have a point of view. And certainly it is legitimate if they come to power through democratic means. Did you want to just just come back on that? Try to remember the sense of the question, which is how are we going to get out of this, and uh, well, so I mean, you could uh, yeah. make, make this the, your last intelligence squared debate, at least for a while. Okay, I mean, look, and the whole point of anything that I'm doing really is arguing that there is this we can't have this. A defense of liberalism is the worst possible thing you would want to do because liberalism is the problem, right? This is the argument that's being outlined um, that actually it is the Enlightenment values which really cement racial. Prejudice, which if you actually think about all the Enlightenment scholars, we talked before, as a point I wanted to come back before, was that there is this variety, it's about cultural relativism, all of them, I was, I was surprised when I read this, all of them had a racial theory, with white people at the top and black people at the bottom, universal across all the different, different countries, it was such an important part of the Enlightenment, um, but it gets embedded into the way that we think in a way that we don't even think about it as racist, right? So we take someone like Immanuel Kant's mm. universal values of human rights, which is deeply racist. And then we wonder why the, the world is still racist. So if we, if we really do want to end this, the only way is to undo the system. This is a systemic analysis. The system can't When you say undo the it. system, then what do you mean? I mean, simply revolution. I mean, I'm not going to lie. This is a revolutionary argument. The, the book so it's a revolutionary argument. Yeah, the book I wrote, this is a pre a prequel to Back to Black, Retelling Black Radicalism, which is the book I wrote previously, which actually says, look, we need to do something different. We need to overturn. You cannot just rely on these institutions because they are actually the problem. Uh, and the whole point of the book was to say, well, look, let's just really analyze it. You can't separate racism from capitalism. So you need to do something else, right? There, there is no other solution than revolution in it. In this argument. Can I just point out that as far as Enlightenment values are concerned, it was Enlightenment values that got rid of the Western slave trade, the slave oh, trade. Oh, isn't it? No, just listen. It was Western values, it was Enlightenment also that came along with monogenesis. As you may know, the previous European view had been what was known as polygenesis, the idea that there were two different human species. Monogenesis, which comes in in the 1770s, is the argument that all human beings can come from the same uh, genetic stock. So I do think that um, you are providing a false and misleading account of the Enlightenment. No doubt with your revolution, you will destroy everybody that has different views. And I fear very much well. that if you succeed, you're a bad man. A revolution that simply seeks to assert one set of values in your fashion is actually very dangerous. It's, it's, for me, it's actually not about values. It's yes, about sure. making sure that nine million people don't die every year from hunger, which is actually the, and not to, to, to have this false version of the Enlightenment, where you believe, if you honestly believe that monogenesis is better than polygenesis of an issue of race, and I really suggest you go read some more of the, of the Enlightenment. Because it and, and there's nothing no really just to, 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 to sort of slightly probe your <laughs> revolutionary zeal it's always been, well, the, the, the use of intelligence squared debates to to call out revolution to the barricades is probably at least it's, it's not so frequent i suppose it has happened before <laughs> and has seen everything um but <laughs> do you think that there's any danger to that because one what you don't think you do know and you're a widely read historian so is uh, uh, Jeremy Black. You, you read history very differently. That, but this claim that something must be done, the answer is revolution, it must inevitably be better, has often not been borne out in practice. Perhaps uh, uh, Jeremy wasn't entirely fair to say that, you, that your revolution would be 
I guess, violent or, or do harm to people, but that has tended to be the outcome of revolution, as Edmund Burke pointed out, and, and in more recent times we've seen with uh, 1917 in, in Russia and many other places. What makes you sure that revolution is the answer? Because, like I said, nine million people die from poverty. Like we, because we're here in the West, we kind of just totally um, away from the reality of the world. A child dies every day. Since we're having this conversation, like hundreds of children are dying from poverty. That's the world we live in. And actually, just to make uh, the publishers asked me to be positive at the end of the book, so I was trying to be positive. And uh, the best I could come up with was this, this way of producing capital and this way of exhausting the world is actually going to end the whole world. Climate change. We have to stop. Like we cannot keep going on as though everything is just the same. This, this, the idea that revolution is bad really ignores the state of the world today. And the state of the world today, frankly, is awful. It's as awful as it's ever been, and we need and we need to build it anew. Uh, Jeremy, last uh, qu question to you. Uh, I think it came from an anonymous, sort of anonymous on tonight. Uh, is uh, said that didn't feel that the question had been finally nailed whether the West was racist or not. And as uh, the last word goes goes to you, you um, if you had to nail that argument, and you've heard a lot of challenges uh, tonight uh, from Kindy, but also from the, the questions. What would be your clinching answer as to why the, the West isn't as alleged racist? I don't think that there's an inherent racism in the West. I think there are obviously um, people within it and tendencies in its history which you could regard as racist, both in terms of behaviour, language and analysis. But I would actually personally see... Um, societies as do, as far more dominated by social uh, cohesion and difference and it's worth bearing in mind that um, prior to the 15th century much of the west had not encountered people of different um, races insofar as we can agree, agree on a criteria of what race is and given that so many of the patterns of western behavior and thought were established in that period it's a little odd to think that the last 500 years as it were threw away uh, all the pre-existing patterns of thought and behavior well that brings us for to a close for tonight i've taken as many questions as i could i'm very sorry for those i couldn't get in but you can of course still still tweet and continue uh, the debate there. Thank you, of course, most of all to Jeremy and to Kindy, to the audience and to Intelligence Squared. And you can get a discounted copy of Kindy's new book, The New Age of Empire, How Racism and Colonialism Still Rule the World, by clicking on the link in the audience chat. Man, we are digitally enabled, are we not? Um, thank you to everyone and also, of course, to our great support team, without whom uh, none of this would be happening at all. And, and so smoothly.